Hi and welcome to the Virtual Introductions podcast. From creativity to slang and modern drama to psychopathy, we'll showcase a concise and original introduction to a wide range of subjects, wherever your curiosity may take you. So here is today's very short introduction. I'm Sarah Harper, Professor of Gerontology at the University of Oxford, and I trained as an anthropologist and demographer. My VSI is on demography. Nowadays, much of what I do is in public policy because governments everywhere have realised the power of demography. Population both frames and drives much of what happens in society today, though it is still often seen by some as the poor relation to economics and politics. Let's look at some examples. In the background to the emergence of the First World War, the alliance between France and Russia played a crucial role. While political allegiances had led to this, it is also recognised that it was France losing the demographic race with Germany, which also promoted her alliance with Russia. France received a huge reserve of Russian workers in return for sending over capital and technology. Or we could take the case of 21st century Britain, whose multicultural society emerged from her declining ability to replace her population by births alone during the second half of the 20th century, And this encouraged an exchange of migrant labour from the wider Commonwealth in return for capital transfers. Or Japan, whose early economic success has been partially explained by her high-density population, which enabled technology transfer to occur so rapidly and extensively. Political alliances, cultural change and economic growth can all be attributed in part to the demographic structure of the nations involved. You may have heard the term demography is destiny. While few would maintain quite such a deterministic stance, it is increasingly recognised that population change plays a key role in our political systems, economies and societies at the local, national, regional and even global level. I became interested in demography while still at school when a former pupil came to give a talk. She was working on health differences in Africa and the role that access to urban environments played in reducing deaths for mothers during pregnancy and childbirth. I realised in that classroom that the demography within which you happen to be born framed your entire life. How long you might live, how many children you might have, whether they would be healthy or malnourished, whether you would see your own grandparents or indeed live long enough to be a grandparent yourself whether you would be part of a large birth cohort and have to compete for jobs and housing, or a small one in which you might feel your generation was being ignored. As I progressed with my studies at university, I learnt that the interaction of demographic drivers has led to various outcomes in terms of population size, composition, density and distribution, which vary within and between countries and regions. These then have a significant impact on the societies and communities which they form and also on the individuals who make up those societies and communities. For example, the birth cohort or generation into which each person is born, the demographic composition of that cohort and its relation to those born at the same time in other places and before and after strongly influences individual life chances. Furthermore, it impacts upon the economic and political structures within which that life is lived, structuring access to social and natural resources such as food, water, education, jobs, sexual partners and even the length of an individual's life. In this very short introduction, I start by exploring the way in which the global population evolved over time and space. At the end of the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, There were estimated to be around 1 million Homo sapiens scattered across Europe, Africa and Asia. The next 15,000 years saw a dramatic evolution in human economy and society with the emergence of agriculture, settled dwelling and civilizations. By 5000 BC, the world population had reached an estimated 5 million and each continent was now settled. It took a further 7,000 years for the human population to reach 1 billion by around 1800 AD. Then the advent of urbanisation and industrialisation led to a steady increase in population numbers. The population doubled to 2 billion by the early 1900s and within 50 years had doubled again to 4 billion and reached 6 billion by the millennium. 
It then stands at some seven and a half billion and is projected to reach around 10 billion during this century. The book then moves to explore contemporary demography, which may be divided into three separate areas of interest. Firstly, is the study of the characteristics of past or current populations with regard to their size and composition, such as age, sex, marital status, education, ethnicity and socioeconomic group. Second is the study of the different processes which directly influence this composition. Primarily, fertility, mortality and migration. These are sometimes known as the demographic drivers. And the third area concerns the relationship between these static characteristics and dynamic processes with the social, economic and cultural environments within which they interact. And demographers are also moving to consider the implications of these characteristics, processes and relationships for policy. Indeed, as I discuss in the book, demographers have now developed a range of sophisticated tools of analysis and enabled a multidisciplinary approach to be taken, which can address a variety of contemporary issues and also makes use of the predictive power of demography to look into the future. As I mentioned, I started in anthropology, moving into population studies and then demography as my career progressed. Indeed, demography can now be seen as a broad collective, drawing on disciplinary backgrounds from across the social, mathematical and even biological sciences. So we have anthropological demography, which draws on anthropology to better understand demographic phenomena within small scale communities. Historical demography, looking at past trends and drivers, stretching back to prehistoric times with the establishment of the study of paleodemography. Biodemography combines evolutionary biology and genetics with demography, looking at, among other things, gene environment interactions. Social demography focuses on society and social change. Economic demography on the relationship of population and economics. All these and others have developed their own specific methods to understand the drivers, processes and interactions and contribute to our understanding of the so-called demographic transition. The fact that as societies grow more wealthy, they typically reduce their childbearing and increase their life expectancy and their populations start to decline and age. In writing the VSI on demography, it was fascinating to go back and reread the first statistical studies of the 17th century. The Royal Society was established in 1660, dedicated to empirical observation and experiment. Newton and colleagues at Cambridge were developing calculus, the science of mechanics and the theory of gravity. The identification of mathematical formula which explained God's work in physics and the physical world was a natural path to discovering further formula which would explain his plan for the human body. All around was death, emanating from the relentless spread of the plague. The Bills of Mortality, which published weekly numbers of London burials, provided the perfect source from which to explore the laws of life and death programmed into the world at God's creation. John Gaunt was a merchant who set out to find the characteristics of his customers and discovered the role of plague in defining the age structure of London. The use of this data by Gaunt to create the first primitive life table in 1662 was the original piece of research in demography. The laws of the earth, the sea and the sky had been joined by a mathematical law of life and death. But it was a century later that the founding of modern demographic studies would occur. It's 1798. The world population has more or less reached one billion, but nobody knows that yet. This was the time of the Irish Rebellion, the aftermath of the French Revolution. Napoleon's fleet was at sea, his destination unknown. There was unrest and famine on land. Poor harvests and high food prices threatened the rural poor and labour riots erupted. The conditions of the poor, the unrest of the working man, the spread of radicalism all combined to spur Thomas Malthus to write his thesis, an essay on the principle of population. Food is necessary to the existence of man. The passion between the sexes is necessary and will remain in its present state. The population will increase geometrically. Food will increase at the smaller arithmetic ratio. While currently population growth was restrained by war, famine and pestilence, Malthus believed it was important to take up preventative checks, restraint, reason and foresight, to limit the population, alleviate suffering 
and improve the well-being of mankind. Malthus was, of course, unaware that he inhabited a world which was on a tipping point. Europe was about to experience new availability of land, both within the continent and in new lands overseas, which would alleviate rural population pressure through migration and new sources of food. In addition, birth control was slowly spreading from France across the continent. Thus, while the passion between the sexes might not be controlled, the outcome, births, could be. The European demographic transition was about to begin. Now, Malthus is criticised for his failure to anticipate that the agricultural revolution, emigration and birth control would avert his predictions of disastrous overpopulation. Yet he understood the dynamics of the population drivers of fertility and mortality and thus laid the basis for modern population studies. Demography may not be destiny, but it can provide the scientific evidence needed to guide governments and policy makers across the 21st century. And that is why I work so closely nowadays with policy makers exploring such challenges. For example, the high childbearing rates in sub-Saharan Africa and the role of education and health in enabling women to have choice over the size of their families, the impact of local and global population on biodiversity, the impact of the ageing of the population on the care of older adults today, and the future prospects for younger generations. And I and my colleagues ask such questions as, what is the relationship between population and consumption in different parts of the world? How will we feed and provide water for the projected 9 or 10 billion of us by the middle of this century? And will climate change lead to widespread movement of environmental refugees? Such are the undoubted challenges facing the human population around population growth and consumption that there has been a return by some to revisit Malthus. Malthus constantly sought to emphasise the complexity of the interrelationship between population, environment, socio-economic structures and policy responses. Perhaps the founder of demographic studies still has a message for modern day demographers. Over the next decade, some two billion babies will be born. Two billion children will need to start school and over one billion young adults will need to find work. Understanding the impact of this has significant implications for the future of our planet and demographers can play a key role in this process. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Instructions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher to receive new episodes directly to your podcast feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Mm-hmm.